If you're in a river in South America and you turn over a rock, fish will rush in to see what potential food has been exposed. And quite often the first fish on the scene are anastomids. The fish most of you will know are leporinus. They have a huge diversity. Not only are there over a hundred leporinus species, but there are also 15 other genera that are related. In this group is where we can find some of the really crazy adaptations to life in the rapids. So today I want to show you my three favorites and tell you a bit about where they live. They are not only smaller than the leporinus that you likely banished from your aquarium because it relentlessly chased the other fish, but their bizarre adaptations to feed make them no threat to other fish. All three are actually fairly widespread, but rare in nature, and also hard to catch because they do not only live in the rapids, they also live in the most complex tunnels, crevices, and caves carved out under the boulders. For smaller fish to thrive in this kind of environment, they have to adapt. For cichlids, that usually means they lose their ability to swim and hop on the bottom like Teleocicla or the African Steatocranus. Flecos are ideally adapted for this, and other fish that live in the rapids usually become powerful swimmers like Tomatus or Crenicicla. In the Xingu, much of the middle section consists of rapids. If you're interested in more than this video, come to BelowWater.com and buy a book on the Xingu, and also have a look at the other Xingu videos tagged in the description. Leporinus, Leporellus, Inspiranus, Hypomasticus, Pseudanus, and others are all found in the rapids, but it is these three fish that are hard to see that I want to look at today. And I want to show you the first footage of Biden's anastomid, Gnathodolus bidens. I spent nearly 10 years trying to get this fish, and it is so odd that it is worth having in an aquarium just to watch it feeding. The first of the three is Synaptolemus latofasciatus, the flamingo anastomid, which is more widespread than just in the Xingu, and a little more common in the hobby. These orange bars can vary from bright red to yellow, and they will reach up to 17 centimeters or 7 inches. Their adaptation is actually the least extreme, but still interesting. The mouth is slightly upturned and the lips have these extensions like a star-nosed mole. People that keep plecos will see a similarity to some species of plecos, including Leporacanthicus. Synaptolemus lives in crevices, ideally in horizontal splits of larger boulders, and they just very rarely come out far from their preferred territory, just to feed on something in the open water and return to the crevice. Most of their day is spent searching the roof of the boulders, often overgrown with sponges. They search for microinvertebrates in those spaces, and especially if there is a strong current, you can see that this allows them to feed in places most other fish cannot easily reach. You guessed right that if this fish, and the others we will see today, want to feed on the bottom, they actually have to turn upside down. Despite that they are horizontal, upright swimming fish, they are amazingly adept at grazing on their backs and will frequently do so. This crevice is actually occupied by two adults and some juveniles. I had the camera running some time in this location and some adult Crenicicla dandara would pass in and out of the same crevice. This is why these special anastomids are small. They can easily avoid the Crenicicla by just staying in the more narrow portion of the crevice. You would also see zebra plecos, maybe Ancestrus ranunculus, hopley Ancestrus wolverine, and others in these spaces. The flamingino, as this species is called by the fishermen, is actually quite rare in the river. It is cryptic, so you don't see these swimming around. But if you look long enough, and in places with highly complex bottoms, you can find them. You just don't see many of them together. In the aquarium, synaptolemos are actually quite peaceful towards other fish but should be in a group so they don't push one fish around. I found that they get totally ignored by other anastomas. I guess that is pretty clear to them that the fish with the bright red vertical stripes is a different species. That is not always the case. For example, my Leporellus will chase other Leporinus aggressively, maybe because their horizontal lines make them look similar, or maybe because they compete for feeding territory with them. When the Synaptolemos do get into a fight with each other, it is always 10 rounds. It starts with two fish chasing each other. They will then challenge each other to a pushing match, where they go side to side and race through the aquarium pushing each other around. This happens with all anastomids, and it takes a long time to determine a winner. 
This match can take even two hours and is of course great for photography. Despite their large teeth, the fish rarely get damaged from these fights. Eventually a winner is determined and the losing fish will leave the territory. I think that it is important to keep these fish in small groups and not alone and in oversized aquariums because you want the losing fish to have a safe place to get away from the winner. The second fish in the list of weirdos is Sartor respectus. This odd fish is found only in the rapids of the middle Shingu River. But there are two other species in the neighboring Tocantins River and on the other side of the Amazon in the Jari. Sartor is the Latin name for tailor, someone that works with a needle. And this fish has two bright red backwards facing teeth. Its mouth is also facing backwards at an extreme angle, giving it that inbred pug look. But this has a good reason. Sartor feed on the surface of overhangs, where they look for microinvertebrates inside the sponges and biocover. If you think about how they would do that in strong current, you could see why the mouth facing backwards would actually be an advantage. Sartor gets about the same size as Synaptolemus, but all these fish grow really slowly. In nature, you will find Sartor at about 2 meters or close to 7 foot depth and below. Unlike Synaptolemus, which really likes highly complex bottoms, Sartor likes big boulders and not only horizontal but also vertical crevices. In the river, they appear nearly black with red fins, but I find in the aquarium they can appear almost purple with golden scales. You find Sartor pretty much anywhere in the middle Shingu, but never more than one body length from the nearest rock surface. They actually get along reasonably well, and you can find them in small troops of 4 to 10 fish. They spend all their time grazing on the surface above their heads, and will occasionally turn upside down to feed off the bottom, even on bedrock. Their favorite places are large overhangs, where the water is really blowing through at a high pace. I think most predators would have trouble angling their bodies to grab one of these fish, and so this is a very safe place for them to live. Like many Shingu fish, this is a fish of the shadows. The Shingu River is a river of shadows, where black is the predominant color, and many fish reflect that in their coloration. When light does penetrate, those white spots on the fish make them actually well camouflaged. Sartor, on the other hand, is always in the dark and they are easier to find than Synaptolemus, but very difficult to catch, simply because it is hard to make them get away from their substrate long enough to net them. This group will occasionally travel outside the overhang, only to return to their boulder cave, and on occasion you can see Hopley Ancestors Wolverine and some Gold Nugget Plecos or Bari Ancestors Zantellus in this cave as well. But let's get to our third fish. Nathodolus bidens is actually much more widespread than the other two, but its preference for the strongest rapids and open but deeper water makes them really hard to capture. It has been described for almost 100 years ago, but it's not named after Joe Biden. The scientific name, the Mathodolus Bidens, translates as something like mouth trap with two teeth, which is just perfect. It is great that we finally get to observe these in an aquarium. In nature, you'll find these in rapids, but in the middle of the strongest flow, off of the substrate. A place where you cannot use a net nor hold on to anything. I have seen this fish only once in nature, at about 5 meters or 15 foot depth, bouncing around the current. Their swimming style is so chaotic that the Shingo fishermen call them the crazy leperinus. This fish is rare. So rare that it is one of the species we are unable to include in the Shingo book since we did not have a photo of a live specimen in nature or in the aquarium. What makes this fish so special is the structure of the lower jaw. It has the same razor-sharp red teeth as Sartor and star-nosed mole appendages found in both the others. But the lower jaw is very narrow and it can be opened forward to create a kind of wand that can feel around holes and crevices for prey. When I first saw a dead specimen of this fish, I thought it was deformed because the mouth structure is so wild that it looks abnormal for a freshwater fish, let alone a leperinus. When Gnathodolus are looking for food, that lower jaw is projected down and forward. It can also be angled to either side. The fish will then feel around holes and crevices for potential prey. Two extremely sharp bright red teeth then stab the prey and bring it backwards into the mouth. So far I believe they will reach the same size as the other two species in this video. 
Gnaphodolus also turn bright yellow when they are fully adult. As juveniles, they are more beige or cream colored, and some individuals will also have reddish fins. It is actually a very beautiful fish, and the combination of these three odd-looking anastomids are now my favorite aquarium. Also, because I waited so long to get this amazing fish. Most experienced fish keepers have a list of 10 species that they are looking for, and it is always nice to check one of those off the list. Unlike the other two species, Gnaphodolus are much more adept swimmers and very good at catching prey in the open water. In nature, these are seen swimming in the open water in the strongest current, where this complex feeding mechanism is not really needed, so it is too bad that this fish is so hard to observe. Perhaps they do feel around the substrate just like they do in the aquarium. Leperinus and their relatives are notoriously difficult to breed in the aquarium, and I think it's because they are spawning in large groups and may also migrate to lay their eggs in the flood zone of the rivers. But these specialists like Sartor, Synaptolemus and Gnathodolus, as well as their immediate relatives such as Anostomus, Petulanus or Pseudanus, are likely to travel not far from their territory. Perhaps these fish will breed in the aquarium in the right conditions, but I have not been able to observe them. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to this channel and share this video on social media. You can also come to belowwater.com and buy a book on the Shingu. Also, check out my other videos on the Shingu River and the first guide to anastomid fish, all linked in the description.